cassava in the first year, you plant cassava on plot one, maize on plot two, yam on plot three, then granules on the fourth plot. Then in the second year, you plant maize in your first plot, yam now in the second plot, granules in the third plot, then cassava in the next plot. Then in the third year, you plant your yam in the first plot, then granules in the second plot, cassava in the third plot, then maize in the fourth plot. Then for the fourth year, Granite is planted in the first plot, cassava in the second plot, maize in the third, then yam in the fourth. So looking at plot one now, you are planted the four times in four years. It's the same thing for all the plots. So that's what we call crop rotation. So this is a typical example of a crop rotation plan for four years on four plots. Now we'll move on to the advantages of crop rotation. What benefit does crop rotation have? Number one, it maintains the crop yield. At least by the time you are changing the crops, the nutrient that, that is taken away in year one is replenished in year two or year three. So it doesn't take the same type of nutrient. So you maintain, you kind of balance the crop yield. Then the second advantage is that you conserve the natural environment. It is not depleted. Then you control plant pests, diseases, and weeds. There are pests, diseases, and weeds that are associated to a particular plant. So when you keep planting that plant, you keep establishing those pests because they are now used to that, that land. They are, used, they are so used to that soil. But by rotating the crop, so you don't have any pest established. By the time you plant a crop this year, and you don't plant it again until the next five years, those pests that are associated with it must have left your farm. But when you keep planting a particular plant on the farm, then you keep establishing the pests, the diseases, and the weeds that are associated with that plant. Then crop rotation prevents land disputes, which result from shifting cultivation. Instead of planting a particular plant here and after a while you leave that land and move to another land you leave that land to rest you leave the first land to rest and move to another land by the time you come back some people might have taken over your land because you did not farm on it for a long time but this crop rotation method helps you to keep to maintain the soil and by still planting on it, but you are now exchanging what is on the soil. Instead of leaving it to fallow so that it can regain nutrients, you are planting different types of crop on it. So it still maintains its fertility. The next farming practice or type of farming is shifting cultivation. Shifting cultivation is embarked upon by a peasant farmer that plants a particular plant or a particular crop on a plant. Then leaves the after the harvest, he leaves that particular land for one or two years. Then he abandons that particular land for a fresh one. Why does he do that? He does that to let the plant, the land, that soil, that particular land rest, so that it can regain the nutrients that it has lost in the productive years. That's what shifting cultivation is all about. The abandoned farmland regains fertility in the fallow period. So it's like asking the land to go on holiday or vacation. It's not planting anything on it for, for some years. The fallow period is for about five years or more. And that was why I was explaining the crop rotation that crop rotation helps to prevent land disputes that, that results from shifting cultivation. Because by the time you don't do anything on the land for four to five years, you know, somebody else might have encroached on your land. Then we talk about mist farming. Mist farming is another type of farming system whereby you plant crops and also raise animals on the same farmland at the same time. For instance, you are planting cassava or you are planting granules. Okay, let's use granules as an example. You are planting granules and you are also ra raising cow on your farm. That's what we call mist farming. The animals enrich they farm with their remains, that is with their droppings. They supply nutrients to the soil. By the time they move about the farm and defecate, 
so their dung is fertilizer for the soil, then byproduct of the crop serves as food for the livestock. They serve as their feed. Crop pipe byproducts such as granules, straw, soybean, they all serve as food for the livestock. So they benefit both the plants and the animals now. They have a mutual association. Then some of these animals, like the cow and ass, they serve as a means of transportation on the farm or for plowing. So that's also, also another advantage. So they can transport fertilizer, transport harvested crop on the farm, or they can be used to plow the farmland. That's what means farming is all about. Then the pastoral farming. Pastoral farming involves rearing of, of grazing animals. You rear grazing, grazing animals like goats, sheep, and cow. So this is like half of meat farming. It just phases rearing of animals like cow, like goats, like sheep. Then the nomadic, the nomadic farmer, like the full animals that we have in Nigeria, they move their animals from one grazing land to another. So they allow the animals to feed on green grass. So they move towards where they find green grass. So they move across the place looking for green pasture for their livestock. Then overgrazing of a land exposes the land to erosion. We have talked about that earlier. That when a land is being overgrazed, that is animals feed too much. They rely on a particular land, they keep feeding on it year in, year out. They overgraze the land and exposes the land to erosion. The last type of farming that I'll be talking about is this strip cropping. In this part of farming, the farmer divides the land into strips, that is, into narrow pieces, running along the contour lines of the slope. It's done around the sloping ground. Then each strip may be planted with crops that expose the land, like maize, and then it will, it will also plant. It will plant two types of crop on the strip. It will plant the plants that expose the land, land e.g. maize. Then you also plant others that cover the land. You know, maize you just stand, then you have spaces on the farm. But you also plant other plants that will cover the soil alternatively. You plant maize, you plant potato, for example. You know, potato is a cover crop. So potato will cover the plant. At the same time, maize is there. So that's what we call street cropping. Then growth of cover crops now prevents erosion. Then the narrow strips prevent water from running off the slope, from gathering enough speed to do damage to the crop. So that is strip cropping. Now we'll be looking at microorganisms around us and we'll be talking about what they have, their benefits, their harmful effects, their various types, what to do with them, and everything about microorganisms. And first we'll be talking about classification of microorganisms. There are five groups of microorganisms. We have the bacteria, the viruses, the protozoa, fungi, and algae. So those are the five groups of microorganisms that we'll be dealing with now. Bacteria. Bacteria is a microscopic unicellular organism. It's no chlorophyll. There is no chlorophyll in bacteria. And bacteria consists of a thin mass of cytoplasm containing DNA and stored food. We have some bacteria having flagella at one end, while others have their flagella at both ends. And we've talked about the function of flagella. Flagella is majorly for movement. So some bacteria have their flagella at one end, while some others do have theirs at both ends. Bacteria are aerobic, anaerobic, and facultative. That is, they use oxygen while others do not use oxygen in their respiration. Bacteria undergo a sexual reproduction by binary fission. They undergo a sexual reproduction by binary fission. This is an example of bacteria. Then we have types of bacteria. Bacteria are classified according to their shapes. So there are various shapes are used in classifying them. We have the cochi, those are the spherical shaped bacteria. 
and they are also in classes or in groups. The Koki are also in group. You have the tetrads, those that are in force. You find them in force. Then the diplococci, those that are in pair. Two, 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 two. Those are diplococci. They have the streptococci, the long chain, the long chain spherical bacteria. Then we have the staphylococci. Staphylococcus, you have heard about it. It is more popular in this group of bacteria. It's a bunch. The spherical shaped bacteria that is in bunch. We also have the diplobacillus. That's a rock shaped bacteria. Then the next type of bacteria we have is the bacillus. Those are the spherical shaped bacteria. We have the spirally, those that are spiral in shape. Then the vibro, those that are filamentous in nature. So you can see them, all of them are bacteria, but they are in different shapes and sizes. We move on to talk about viruses. Viruses are microscopic and parasitic in nature. Microscopic parasites or saprophytes. Parasites living on another organism to its detriment. Saprophytes feeding on dead organisms. So they are microscopic, you can't see virus in your eyes. Then viruses don't have nucleus or cytoplasm. They do not respire, they do not excrete, neither do they show sensitivity. So they don't go through respiration, excretion, or irritability. They are crystallized like salt and stored in that form. They are in crystallized form. Also, viruses cannot reproduce outside of cells.